power. What do you think when you hear the word power? If you're like most people, the word power may be a slightly dirty word like networking or sales. Power? Power for all? What the heck does that even mean? Let's do this. Let's talk about talk. Welcome to Talk About Talk, episode number 129, Power for All. I hope you have an open mind, because after you've listened to this episode, you're going to have a very different idea about what power can and should be. First, though, let me introduce myself. My name is Dr. Andrea Wojnicki, and I'm your executive communication coach. Please call me Andrea. I'm the founder of Talk About Talk, where I coach communication skills to ambitious executives to help them elevate their communication, their confidence, and their clarity, so they'll get noticed for the right reasons, and ultimately, they'll get promoted. That's my goal here. I want to help you accelerate your career trajectory. If you go to the talkabouttalk.com website, you'll find many resources to help you out. There's information there about coaching, online courses, corporate workshops, the archive of this bi-weekly podcast, and I really hope you'll sign up for the Talk About Talk newsletter. That newsletter is your chance to get communication coaching from me every week. Every week, I choose one communication topic, and then I coach you on three things related to that topic. Always the power of three. All right, because you listen to this podcast, I'm gonna guess that you have a growth mindset and you probably read a lot, or at least you try to. Recently, when I was browsing in Audible, I came across this book, Power for All, that was written by one of my favorite colleagues at the University of Toronto, Professor Tiziana Cacharo. Of course, I downloaded and I devoured it right away. And after I finished the first few chapters, I decided to email Tiziana and ask her if I could interview her for this episode. Here we are. I love this book. Lately, my strategy for consuming books has been listening to them. I listen when I'm getting ready in the morning. I listen when I'm going outside for a walk or I'm gardening. And I even listen when I'm in my car. So I managed to get through a lot of books. And when I find one that I really like, like this one, Power for All, I usually go to the bookstore and I also buy a hard copy of the book. And then it's easier for me to reference back to it. And of course, I'm happy to support my favorite authors. Anyway, I am really excited to have reconnected with Tiziana and to share our conversation with you. Whether or not you decide to buy the book and read it, you will learn a lot in this episode. Okay, let's get into this. I'm going to start by introducing Tiziana right now, and then we're going to get straight into the interview. Please stay tuned to the end because I'm going to summarize with my top three, of course, three favorite insights from this interview. It's always the power of three. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about Tiziana. Our careers have crossed paths twice before. Years ago, Tiziana was on the faculty at Harvard Business School when I was a doctoral student there. And then we both served on the faculty at the University of Toronto, where she's now a professor of organizational behavior and the Marcel Desatel Chair in Integrative Thinking. Tiziana is originally from Italy, as you will hear from her beautiful accent. She received her BA from Bocconi University in Milan, And then she earned her MS and PhD in organizational science and sociology from Carnegie Mellon. Her research on organizational networks, professional networking, power dynamics, and change leadership has appeared in the top academic journals in management, psychology, and sociology. And she's also received distinguished scientific achievement awards from the Academy of Management. Yes, Tiziana is a smart one, and her research is making an impact. Thinkers 50 recognized Tiziana as one of the 30 thinkers most likely to shape the future of how organizations are managed and led. She regularly publishes in the Harvard Business Review, and her work has been featured in The Economist, The Washington Post, The New York Times, CNN, Fortune, and Time Magazine. In this episode, you're going to hear our conversation about the book that she co-authored with Professor Julie Badalana, who serves on the faculty at Harvard Business School. 
The book is called Power for All. And the subtitle is How It Really Works and Why It's Everyone's Business. Like I said, this award-winning book is going to change how you think about power. Thank you so much, Tiziana, for joining us here at Talk About Talk to talk about your book, Power for All. Thank you for having me, Andrea. I'm so excited for this conversation, Tiziana. I want to start with a definition because different people have different things in, in mind when they think about power. So can you define power for us? Absolutely. And you're right that uh, the definitions abound and we have to pick one that helps us the most. And uh, my wonderful co-author Julie and I picked the following. Power is the ability to influence the behavior of others. So influence is kind of embedded in the definition of power. And what makes it uh, comprehensive, that definition, is that influence can take multiple forms, some benign, like persuasion, where I influence you by depicting a future, a possibility, a goal, a, a scenario that is attractive to you and you want to kind of hop on. And I influence you because you want to be there. And uh, influence can also be a little bit more malign in the form of coercion, where I influence you, I change your behavior by force because I make you. And all of that is uh, belongs under the umbrella of power. Okay, so I, I you brought up influence, which was going to be one of my next questions, because I want to compare power to some other terms that we throw around when we're talking about similar things. So is it necessary if there is power to have asymmetry? Not necessarily, no, because power is a relational by construction, meaning uh, I don't have power in the absolute. I have power relative to someone in a specific context. That so helps. this is a really very, very social definition of power. So if you think about where does this ability to influence others come from, where does power come from? It comes from my having something you want or need, and you needed me to get it, such that it's not easy for you to get access to that thing you want from someone other than me. In that sense, I control your access to something you want and I can influence you because you depend on me to get that desired thing. Got it. So in that sense, that's right. Uh, in that sense, power can go both ways such that I may have something you want and it's hard for you to get it elsewhere. So you depend on me. So that's okay. But we're not done in understanding our power relationship because you could also have something I want. And I also may find it hard to get it from people other than you. And therefore, in that sense, we have a mutual uh, level of power on each other. And it doesn't necessarily mean that I lose power if, if you gain some. We could both be increasing our mutual dependence. Got it. Okay. So it is, it depends on the person and then, or the, the at least dyad, if not more, right? And also on the context. Absolutely. Okay. okay. So how does it differ from leadership or how does leadership play into this? So you can you can say that um, leadership is an exercise in influence because, you know, you, again, you can define leadership in a million different ways. Um, sometimes you have the very straightforward definition is basically the act of leading a group of people which is almost tautological, leadership is leading, but the idea is you conduct people in a certain direction. And intrinsic to that, leadership is influence because you cannot direct them, you cannot conduct them anywhere if they are not changing their behavior in response to your leadership. So uh, without influence, there is no such thing as leadership. So in that sense, Power is essential to any leadership endeavor. Got it. You will be quoted on that, Tiziana. I can guarantee it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So as I was sharing with you at Talk About Talk, we talk a lot about the power of three. And when I was reading your book, first listening to it, then reading it, 
I was thrilled to see that you've identified three fallacies of power, which I think really help define, further define what power is. So can you take the listeners through the three fallacies of power? Uh, absolutely. The number three is a magical, you know, it, is. it has a way of, of working all the time and it allows us to kind of zero in on something that we can't remember. So the first of the fallacies of power is that it is uh, very much absolute, like we said before, that um, it, it resides in the person. That is something that you have. You, Andrea, are powerful in the absolute. And that is never, ever, ever, ever true. Uh, power is always relative to the person in front of you, the group in front of you, the multiple people that you are trying to influence. So I may have power over you in this moment, but uh, the circumstances change, and all of a sudden, I don't. And we observe this all the time, except that we tend to personalize power. We tend to attribute it to people as a, as a set of characteristics or traits mm. or backgrounds that allow somebody to be particularly influential in a given context, but it's always context-driven. So we have to kind of disentangle ourselves on this notion that we are to attribute a lot of power to certain people and none to others, because that changes over time as the circumstances change. So it's so power is not permanent. And I'm thinking in my head about when people say, oh, he or she is so powerful. It's like, you know, in that statement, it sounds as if they believe that it is, as you said, a trait, when in fact it's not a trait and it's not permanent. It's just context dependent. That's right. And of course, you know, there is something to be said about certain characteristics and things a person can offer being relevant in multiple contexts, right? Mm -hmm. That make you relevant and therefore powerful in multiple contexts. So uh, the infamous notion of charisma that is as nebulous as it sounds uh, really is a representation of certain things you do, say, moves you make, uh, feelings that you elicit in others they make you attractive to them in that that particular set of circumstances. And that could potentially translate. If you have a certain uh, intelligent, piercing intellect or sense of humor or capacity to understand the future and Mm -hmm. help people understand the big picture, those those could be things that are relevant through multiple circumstances that lead people to say, oh, my God, Andrea, such charisma. And all of a sudden, we attribute this kind of permanence of power to your person when, in fact, you know, it is uh, always circumstantial and changeable. Okay. And that's important to understand because it, it frees us to reshape that power relationship when it's not working for us. If I believe that it's a trait that is going to be with you no matter what, I'm going to be intimidated and, and discouraged from trying to mess around with your power. But if I go like, well, you know, it's right now. It's in this moment that Andrea is so cool and everybody follows her. But we can change that. We can change it. I don't mean to do that to you, by the way. (laughs) I'm completely happy. Go on, go on. Very happy, very happy. But um, it, it makes us a little bit more agentic in acting on a situation because we're not uh, prisoners of this notion that you are just it and nothing's going to change it. Mm. Uh, I, can, I, I can imagine that being very, uh, I was going to say powerful, so I, I won't say that. That would be very, <laughs> I guess, important to consider, for example, if you're in a negotiation and you have this idea, this preconceived idea that that your person that you're negotiating with is powerful, right? Maybe That's there's right. a context that you can change. Okay. That's right. You you can certainly open up uh, different possibilities in finding territory that you can work within, with right. a person, without being captive of this aura. Uh, and that lead, leads me to the, the second uh, fallacy that we see all the time. People assuming that power and uh, authority are one and the same. Mm. So you are in an organizational context, could be a company, could be a public institution, could be whatever. And there are the CEOs, there are the presidents, there are the senators, there are the uh, EVPs. And because of their rank in the formal hierarchy, 
we attribute lots of power to them. It's not completely uh, off because, of course, they have some power. By definition, if you are in a certain positional uh, role, you may have decision-making power and control over resources I, the subordinate, need and want. If you're my manager, you control my performance evaluation that in turn controls my compensation, my promotion ability, my ability to, to let, land in, in a team that I really want to work with. So you do control valued resources that I really, really would like to have access to. In a sense, you do have power. But the things that people value are much more varied than that, such that we encounter all the time situations where you have this uh, executive with potentially even a good strategy, a strategy that makes sense. It's good uh, on paper, but they can't execute it. And they can't execute it because the strategy doesn't speak to what the people that are supposed to implement it really want. Right. And so they push back and so they resist because you have to figure out what they're after and you're not offering it to them through this vision of yours and you lose them along the way. So you, 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 you're a bit to influence them uh, wanes basically. So this notion that power and formal authority are one and the same, it needs to also be thrown uh, uh, to the side because it captures only part of the action. There's much more that can lead you to gain power than just formal rank. Yeah, we'll get into the power mapping in a minute, but you're you're reminding me of some examples in my past work history where we were focused on instituting some organizational change and we were purposefully seeking the opinion leaders, right? These are the opinion leaders who have the power. And I know I remember also in your book you have the example of the maintenance workers in a manufacturing plant. They really have all the power, right? Yeah. Absolutely. They control the one thing that everybody needs, which is a working machine. Exactly. You know, if I can't produce anything and you're paying me based on production and these uh, machine maintenance uh, folks don't tell me how to fix the machine, they hoard that knowledge so that we all depend on them. And it's simple as that. Right. So we've got power is permanent. No, it's not. Power is a function of authority and formal status or rank in a hierarchy? No, it's not. What's the third fallacy? The third fallacy is that uh, power is dirty. Power is a dirty business that is uh, predicated on coercion, manipulation, meanness, uh, cunning, all the bad stuff. Um, Just like authority, it's not uh, the case that Power is, is never dirty. It can be. Right. It often is. And it's and it's the, the version of power that we pay more attention to because human beings have to be especially attuned to the negative because the negative can kill us. So evolutionarily, mm. we respond to negative instances of power yep. use more than the positive. So we have the Leah Grimanis who changes the world for better by helping these homeless women. We don't even remember that. But right. we remember all the house of cards type uh, people that use manipulation, right? To get ahead, to yeah. achieve their goals, and they step on everybody's uh, bodies and they don't care. Yeah. Uh, so this is all true, but it, it, uh, again, it misses some of the important facets of power that really would, would allow us to have the impact we want. Because power is nothing but energy. It's the energy to affect the world around you. Mm. Like any form of energy, it can be used for constructive purposes or destructive ones. Uh, A hammer is a hammer. Uh, I can use it to put a, a nice picture on the wall in my office. I can use it to smash somebody's head. I can use it in all kinds of different ways. It's still a hammer. So much of the decision when we when we deal with power is not only how we're how we going to get it, which is very important, otherwise you can do nothing, you're paralyzed without it. But once you have acquired it, how are you going to use it? Toward what? And that is more the, the, the moral ethical dimension of it. But if you let yourself be caught in this notion that power is devious, 
And if you engage with it, you're going to get dirty in the process. You're going to be dragged down into the mud. Then you're never going to get to really make it part of your life. And you're going to lack the essential uh, energy that we all need to accomplish anything, anything. You want to be promoted, you need power. You want to change this process in your organization that you think makes no sense, you need power. You want to make your neighborhood a little bit more welcoming and safer, you need power. Everything we want to do requires it. So we better learn to take the good and uh, create guardrails so that we don't fall in the bad uh, quite as easily as one can when it comes to power. Oh, wow. Tiziana, I, I'm recalling now the first time I told you I listened to the book and then I read the book. The first time I was listening to it, I think it was when you described this third fallacy that I was like, I absolutely need to interview Tiziana about this book because I experience the same thing with my clients with reference to several other terms, in fact. You know, even marketing, just starting at a high yeah. level, right? People say that, say sometimes marketing is manipulat manipulative. Well, no, it can be, but it's not inherently so. Same thing with networking, which I know is very near and dear to your heart and the research that you do. A lot of people feel icky about networking, but networking itself is... I guess, benign, it's an opportunity, right? And it can be done in ways that that create good or maybe maybe not, but it's not networking itself that is negative. Um, and it, it applies even to personal branding, right? So some, some of my clients, they're like, oh, that feels so manipulative. And I'm like, well, if you're telling lies about yourself, maybe, but if you're creating a narrative that's already true, that inspires you and communicates to others the truth about yourself, how is that a negative thing, right? So ah, so this I, I love this third fallacy the most. I, if I had to choose a fallacy, this is the fallacy that I love to think about that's and right. focus on. Uh, yeah. uh, you're speaking, you're preaching to the choir because I feel very strongly that uh, we allow those kinds of perceptions to, to be not only uh, determining of our behavior, but and they prevent us from understanding where, where those reactions come from. Mm. So the example of personal branding is very good because as you said, well, you know, if I am lying about my personal brand, that's one thing, but if it's a, 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 an honest representation of me, that already changes things. And so we found the same, same logic with networking. So there are, yeah. there are two reasons, really, why people feel icky about networking, and people do. Not everybody, of course, is always a nice distribution of responses to any and all of these things. But um, a lot of people fall in this trap of finding networking um, aversive. One, because they think they're inauthentic in yeah. that moment. Yep. If I go to a networking event, the infamous networking mm -hmm. event, yeah. which is, by the way, not the only place where you network, because yeah. you and I are networking as we speak right now, right? Yeah. We are reconnecting for this fabulous podcast of yours we, after not seeing each other for a while. This is an opportunity for us to know what each one of us has been up to, maybe find territory where we can, we can cooperate, we can find some learning. So, um there are many opportunities for you to network that are not inauthentic. But when we go to those networking events, we feel pressured to present a certain persona, a certain facade mm -hmm. that doesn't represent us really faithfully. And that's where we feel the moral contamination of the activity. Anything that is dishonest is morally a little reprehensible. And we feel we know it. And the second reason why people feel that networking is um, a little yucky is that it tends to be selfish. And, you know, I network typically to enhance my career, to enhance my prospects. Uh, you could be networking to make the world a better place, right? But not everybody does that. Let, let's face it. For the most part, it's a kind of self-focused activity. Yeah. And I, can I just, can, can I just inter interject? I have to mention what, one of my colleagues that I work with a lot, uh, she's an executive recruiter named Sharon Ma Jin. 
she and I have coached many executives to change this paradigm of networking from being a selfish thing that we feel icky about to feeling like it's an opportunity to provide value. And once you enter into, you know, the proverbial networking event with a mindset of generosity and adding value, it changes everything. Everything. Yeah. And that is very much rooted in uh, this uh, reaction that we all have that we feel more morally worthy when we do something that is altruistic. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we behave selfishly all the time, of course we do. Yeah. But but our our moral setup as humans gives value to altruistic acts from a moral standpoint. Mm-hmm. So if you do exactly what you described, uh, the, the notion that when you uh, focus on giving in networking, how can I be of help to you? How can I make your life easier? How can I help you achieve your goals? How can I contribute to making your professional life uh, better, more successful, more effective? You've changed the focus of the activity and relieved the person of this moral weight that comes Mm -hmm. with it. Likewise, if you focus on networking as something you want to do to learn, to grow, that's what I do when I go to any of these conversations, any of these lunches, any of these uh, conferences. I always uh, aim to meet somebody new that can teach me something I didn't know. Mm. That's all I really want. And then in the process, I might teach them something they didn't know. And then it becomes mutually beneficial, mutually enhancing. And that's where the best relationships really are. The right. ones where you know we find joy and growth and a sense of possibility in uh, learning from one another and giving each other a little bit of support. Nobody feels guilty about exploiting anyone, no. and nobody feels useless because we all want to feel that we have impact, that we had, that we mean something. If you want to talk to me, that's hugely enhancing for me because it means that you find value in the things I have spent time researching and writing. You're already giving me a valued resource, which is my self-worth or in this conversation. Is that a a bad, nasty networking exploitation? Not at all. It's a mutually beneficial interaction that can make us both better. And that's very much the the logic. And it, it comes right back to power, right? Because power is control over acts over resources that you want right and in this interaction we both have some things that the other person appreciates and we're simply exchanging them in a way that can make us both better what's wrong with that but you have to reframe it in your mind yeah yeah Yeah. Uh, i i love this i love this so i want to shift gears a little bit into the so what for the talk about talk listeners, right? So, so what, what does this mean about what I can and should be communicating in this context of understanding power and asymmetries of influence and the fact that many of us think power is a dirty negative thing? Um, I think a great place to start, uh, Tassiana, might be in terms of power mapping. I find this content, this idea to be um fascinating so yeah um i like i like this pivot because you're right you're interested in um, the power of talk the power of, of what you convey with your image with your words with your um all the little kind of external signs and uh, that's very relevant to power because power is not only substantive it's also perceived Mm-hmm. And um, you, through your talk, your way to present yourself in the world, are conveying that you have value in the eyes of the audience. I may have resources that you desperately want and you cannot get anywhere, but you don't know it because I have not conveyed the existence of those resources and their importance to you. I have not done enough to understand your needs at this point in time. And uh, telling you a story where 
I demonstrate that I could satisfy those needs. That's all about talk. It's all about how you present yourself. It's all about how you narrate the story wherein I can be very useful to you. Yeah. I can provide something that you value deeply. So it's completely intrinsic to, to the story because it's not just substance, it's also presentation, it's also perception that drives it. I was going to say, some it, it can be communicated explicitly or directly. And I, I'm thinking of you know some movie scenes where someone says, you know, I have all the power here or you know what I could do to you, right? <laughs> but it's perhaps more often communicated implicitly or indirectly, right? That's right. You, kind of That's reveal, right. you reveal your resources, you reveal your influence without being That's so explicit right. about it. Yeah, and power mapping is in, in part the exercise of understanding who has influence in a, in a certain social context. It could be okay. a, a business, it could be a community, it could be a group in which you work, a team. And uh, you observe their behavior, the, the subtle or not so subtle signals they send out to understand if they are the ones who are holding the resources that everybody wants around here. Yeah. If they are the ones that people lean on to get access to what is important. And that could be knowledge um, of certain technology, perhaps, that becomes particularly critical for the organization to uh, master and acquire and all of this, I, I realize that Andrea is the only one who knows mm-hmm. that. And you become instantly influential in that context because we all need you. I, you just just uh, brings to mind that movie Hidden Figures about the right. African-American women, women who yeah. worked at computers at NASA. And um, they were um, literally doing computational work by hand with pencil and paper yeah. up until the introduction of the computer uh, the IBM made. And that is a good example of understanding the shifts in the landscape where you say, okay, up to, to this point, the resource that the organization valued was the ability to, to do handwritten computations accurately and with speed. IBM shows up and it shifts it because that ability to compute by hand becomes all of a sudden obsolete. And these women were so attuned with the shift in what what resources become become relevant that they could acquire the new technology, which was came in the in the in the form of learning how to program in Fortran. Remember Fortran? Yeah, I do. I do. I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they decide to navigate the power landscape in, the, in at NASA toward acquiring their resource that had become relevant. Yeah. So power mapping is all about monitoring the environment so that you not only pick up on who has access to what's valued right now, but you're also able to predict what will become valuable. And then you position yourself accordingly so that you don't lose relevance in that context. This is something that that it goes back to the fallacy that power is intrinsic to a person. But honey, it's not. Because the moment IBM shows up with a new technology and you are stuck in your old capability, you become irrelevant very quickly. So we need to be in tune with that. And sometimes in power mapping, the, the, the talk, how people express themselves conveys signals as to their power, their relevance. They may actually sometimes not be substantiated by actual resources that they have control over. It could be all talk and no action. But at least for some time, mm-hmm. it can lead people to think, oh my God, you know, I really that guy, I really need to cultivate because it's so critical to what we do. Look at look at the Look at the way they walk around. Yeah. But it's, so it can be pure, pure appearance, but it may take a while for people to, to scratch under the surface and understand it. And so it can it can carry you for a while, even without something very substantive. Of course, in the long run, substance 
matters and it shows up. Uh, but power mapping includes also this perception that people are able to construct around them. Right. Okay. So I want to I want to get into the perception, and you said the word signaling. Love that word. I use that word a lot in my dissertation, signaling. But before we do that, I just want to summarize. So in my mind, before I read your book, if I was thinking about power mapping in the context of power and social network analysis, I would be thinking of you know a physical network that I would draw on a sheet of paper where I have all these individuals and I'm drawing lines with arrows of who has influence over who. And the big thing here that I'm getting is that it's, it may be that, but it's in a specific context. And so if you're really going to use this tool of power mapping effectively or optimally, you're going to think about what the current context is and what might change. Absolutely. Uh, that the instability and the constant dynamics of where we are are part of power mapping. This is not a geographical map that, you know, pretty much the mountain is there. And yeah, unless something really major happens, the mountain is still going to be there in 100 years. Uh, social maps are extremely variable. Right. So we have to stay with it. And that's why the, the two skills of power mapping are dynamic by definition. They are, they are observation, mm -hmm. literally looking around. Uh, even in this moment, you and I can infer some things from the background of our calls. Of course, you're speaking my language. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, already you're conveying something. And then inquiry, asking questions. Sometimes something you cannot observe. Uh, you're not in the crowd. I don't get to be in your room there yeah. seeing what you have in your office, the signals, your interests, the people you love. I, do, I don't have that. So I have to ask questions. I have to ask around. Say, what's up with Andrea? Why, why is, has she been, I don't know, a little bit distant lately? And and people might give me insight into what goes on in your life so that I will, oh, my God, okay, she really needs this right now. Can I provide it? Or can I connect with people who can help? And all of a sudden, I become relevant to you, not because I knew it from the start, but because I observed the environment enough and I asked enough questions to understand you. And understanding you is the first step toward influence because it allows me to identify what you have at heart in this moment and how I can be relevant to you in achieving the things that matter to you. Yeah. Of course, it has a dark side too, because I could also find out the things you're scared about. Right. The things that vulnerabilities. Are vulnerabilities, and then I can and I can really stick the knife into that wound and use it to make you do things, or I can use it to claim that I can protect you from these threats, mm. and that will also be valuable. Right. But it's the it's the the dark side of yeah. how you deploy your power. And I, I want to acknowledge it because yeah. the last thing you want to do when you present power as this more kind of neutral energy is to lead people to think that you are in some la-la land yeah. of optimism where power is so wonderful and let's all enjoy it. Because we understand very well that power always has this double-edged um, right. nature. Yeah. We do have to look out for it. Right. But yes, the signaling is essential for my navigating who's who, who wants what, who is capable of providing valued resources, not because they say they can, but because they actually can. Yes. And you kind of scratch yeah. underneath this, yeah. this kind of disappearance. We have politicians that do this masterfully. They come out and they tell us, oh, only I can protect you. Right. Because I and, have permanent and, power. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And uh, exactly. And so uh, the power education we all need is, is, is the one that allows us to see through some of those signals, some of those words. So that you go like, well, you know, you say that. Yeah. But truly. Yeah. Can you do these things for, for us? That we, and can you even understand what the needs are? Uh, so, sometimes it's enough to just understand what you want and I can speak the right words to you mm -hmm. that make you feel that you will 
look out for me. Wow. So, so Tatiana, your, your whole spiel there just really reinforced to me that this third fallacy uh, really is the one I, and you, I guess it sounds like you agree. It really is the one that people can get a lot of traction in. If we um, think about our perception of the word power and challenge ourselves with it. And, and I have to say, I also certainly appreciate the responsibility that you've taken, right? And you're saying, as someone who's writing about it, I'm not in La La Land. And it reminds me of Robert Cialdini's work with his influence book. He talks a lot about how influence itself is a benign thing, right? And even uh, is Everton, Rog- Everton Rogers, the um, the author of Diffusion of Innovations, he also talks about Oh, oh right, 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 right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So no, that's right. All, 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 of the, all of these forces are forces. Yeah, that can be that the directed um, in whatever way yeah. to fit, and that's where the, the the moral reasoning that we all are caught to to elaborate on becomes essential. Yeah. Because otherwise, you see what we do see. Yeah, the world is full of people that uh, misuse and abuse power. Yeah. So I I just want to say I appreciate how this book is educating us on really understanding the power, not just how we can use it, but how we can see how others are using it, sometimes in a way that's not moral, if you want to use it, use that term. So I just want to get back to a couple of, of the signals or ways that we're communicating power. I know in the book, you talked about power people have initiative. They take action uh, and they're more persistent. Can you elaborate on that a little bit in terms of communicating power? Yeah, it has to do with um, the infamous idea of confidence Mm. that um, matters so much uh, to give people the, yeah, the agentic sense of possibility that they can take action, that they have not only the ability, but also the legitimacy to take action. And uh, when you are um, always surrounded by signals that you are not in the right group, in the right position, you're not the right person to do something, it becomes very difficult to to have enough confidence to say, no, no, I I am, I can. And um, the, the narratives we construct all the time that make it more difficult for some people to move and try and take the initiative are very powerful. These are much bigger than just uh, the individual or even the interaction, the the relationship. They're out there. They are very macro. They impose a certain view of what a woman can do, what a person of color can do, what a person with a disability can do. And they constrain or expand our sense of what we are able to do in this world. Are we legitimate people in pursuing a certain goal? Or people are going to say, are you crazy? Calm down. It's not for you. Mm. People like you don't do those things. Now, we are, we are living in a society where, thankfully, uh, most people feel that they can at least try certain things, but it, you don't have to go very far for a world where you and I would never, ever, ever, ever be doing this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> you, we certainly would not be doing a show in our entire uh, you know, wild hair, whatever. <laughs> Yours is not wild, mine is. <laughs> um, it doesn't take much change to completely destroy the sense that of possibility different uh, people. So if I'm subjected to that kind of feeling all the time, confidence that I can take action is put under pressure. And then, you know, it's very difficult to find that initiative. And then you have to really dig deep and sometimes be lucky and sometimes encounter people that that give you the sense of confidence again. And, th- and that's why Influence can be so beautiful. Imagine you are down in the throes of depression and a sense that there's nothing for you to look forward to. And somebody comes along 
and reinjects a sense of possibility in you. That's influence, mm. right? They have influenced you. But boy, is there a better form of influence? I don't think so. And it's all part of the same logic, but it can have magnificent effects on people. And it speaks to this idea that you need to uh, be corroborated by your sense of self, your capabilities, by the, the signals that the world is sending you. That is say, of course a woman can be in this occupation. Of course a person of color can achieve this level of prestige. But you need the signals to construct a story where, where you can be that. Mm -hmm. That's why when Barack Obama uh, gave a speech of the yes, we can, it, it was all a boost of the sense of possibility, right. the sense right. of capability that people sometimes forget they have. Uh, sometimes it has to be a collective sense because the, the, the reality you're trying to intervene on is just too daunting for a person individually to have effect. You have to join forces with others to Got do it. something about it. But that is where confidence and the sense of, yes, I can, has to come from. Got it. So before we get to the five rapid fire questions, I just want to finish up with two specific questions related to communication. One is about words or phrases maybe that we can use that will communicate power or maybe help us diagnose power in others. And then the other is with body language. So, so let's start with words or phrases. Are there things that people say verbally that communicate power? Um, you know, this is really complex territory yeah. because again, much depends on the context. I'll give right. an example. I'll give an example. Uh, when it comes to words and uh, even body language, one of the things that we hear is that um, a deeper pitch in voice, um, voluble, voluble uh, uh, project your speech so that yeah. you are clear, you're you're loud enough that people can hear you. You you take the initiative to speak up, to convey that you have a point of view that uh, you have the confidence and the ability to express it, huh? all of that feeds the perception that you're powerful. And then you have contextual features that change that. And I always think about the great Meryl Streep when she was playing Miranda uh, uh, Brisley, I think was the name of the character in The Devil Wears Prada. Yep. Um, she had noticed that people with power tend to speak softly. And it is your job to listen to me. <laughs> Not mine to be heard by you. <laughs> so and well so done, she, she plays she plays Miranda that way through the movie. Yeah. So what are we to take away? Mm. from the laws of, of, of talk to convey power. Well, it depends on the circumstances and, and what yeah. you're doing. So yeah, if I am middle of the road, trying to, 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 to show that I've got it, uh, I may need to speak loudly enough, confidently enough, slowly enough to show that I have it. But it much depends on how you perceive. So for example, um, this whole notion of conveying disappointment and anger. Does it make you look powerful or not? Mm -hmm. It depends. Right. And uh, in this particular case, gender is a huge determinant of the effects of conveying anger on the perception that you're powerful. If you're a man, conveying that you are very disappointed and really uh, irritated and angry about the situation may convey that you have the standing to basically yell at us and, and put us in our place. If you're a woman, 
in most circumstances, what happens is that you're seen as hysterical if you convey anger. That you're too emotional, that you can't control those, those reactions, and you have to calm down. And there are spectacular examples. I'm going to send you a picture that you can put in the uh, episode notes of the difference in the, the uh, leeway that men and women have in expressing anger as a, as a way to convey a powerful position. So you have to be very careful about yeah. uh, interpreting those signals. Uh, you know about those better than I do. So yeah. I, I leave it to you and your podcast to educate uh, readers uh, uh, and listeners. What I, I want to underscore is that the context, again, matters a lot. And it's an interaction of the person, their characteristics, and their environment that makes a signal more or less effective. That's why it's not straightforward to say, oh, Got speak it. more loudly or deepen your voice. It depends. If you are in Japan and you're a woman and you deepen your voice like that, you look weird. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> you, have, you have to be very careful about how, how the signal is interpreted in that locale. Got it. So it depends. I was going to say it depends on the context, but you're saying it also depends on the person, him or herself, right? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Okay, last Same question. Exactly. Last question before the five rapid fire questions. I'm really curious what you think about power posing. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you remind me of, of some great conversation with Amy Cuddy. Yes. With young assistant professors way back in the, in the yeah. day. Um, so, this is research that, again, needs to be interpreted uh, in the nuances. You cannot kind of make a sweep of them. And so there are two components of it that I think have different uh, implications for what we make of power poses. One is how I feel when I do a power pose. The other one is how I'm perceived by others after I've done the power pose. And those is where I think that, that there's some confusion. Uh, my understanding of the research is that when I do the power pose, I do enhance my sense of possibility confidence. If I yep. take up space and I go, like, yeah, well, yep. what? What? Huh? Uh, I am enlarging my presence. I'm using space and I'm feeling that I've got it. Will you? <laughs> After I went to the bathroom before the interview and I go, ah. Oh, and I do the power pose, <laughs> will you as my interviewer perceive me as more powerful? That is less clear. Mm-hmm. In fact, the results are wobbly enough that I wouldn't necessarily count on it. But when it comes to enhancing my sense of power, which by the way, has enormous consequences for my behavior, right. I could be stupid and powerless, but if I think I'm powerful, I would behave differently. That could be helpful for me at least in the short term. So it matters to feel powerful. Otherwise, I'm not going to do anything because I don't think I'm entitled to. I don't think I can. It's very important. So let's listen to that side of the research yeah. without you know, discarding the whole idea uh, because I think it's a, it really does a disservice yeah. to how you can help yourself by enhancing your confidence in that moment. Yeah. So usually when I'm coaching people and specifically – these are folks that have, you know, if it, issues with confidence and maybe imposter syndrome. So we do talk about power posing and, and in the context of self-awareness, right, where there's internal self-awareness and external self-awareness. So internally, you want to be aware of what's your, what your body's doing because you're sending signals up to your brain. If you're acting confident, you'll think you're confident in, in a good way, as you said, but also mm-hmm. external self-awareness. How are other people perceiving you? So maybe you want to do the power pose, as you said in the bathroom before you go into the room, as opposed to in the room when you're, you know, having an interview or an important meeting or a presentation, right? That's right. And all of those you know, kind of um, twists of presence, um, you know, have shown some impact the, the what we wear, right? Uh, they, it, does, it does change uh, the, the, the attire makes you more confident. Yes. Uh, yes. That's yeah. why, you know, when we have these big presentations, we we, we wear certain things yeah. because they give us a, a bit of an armor, a bit, a bit of a uniform of of status. It's, it's a signal that does have repercussions for our actions, how we speak, 
uh, the impact we have on, our, on others. So I, we should not discount those presence things that Amy and others talk about. Yeah. Although we have to be careful, of course, about the nature of the scientific results, because we don't want to sway people based on evidence that is just too weak or too uh, wobbly yeah. to be counted on. Yeah. But the body of work has a lot of stuff that we can draw from. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Okay, ready for the five rapid fire questions? I guess so. I don't know who they are, so you're going to have to remind me. Okay, question number <laughs> one. What are your pet peeves? Oh, God. <laughs> uh, I think lateness, lateness is a bit of a problem uh, for me. Um, so when I am late, uh, I hate myself. <laughs> I find it um, not very thoughtful of others. But my biggest pet peeve, biggest of them all, is the um, changes of behavior upward and downward oh. that some people have. That is a signal of, of weak character and uh, mean intention uh, in my book. So if I observe somebody behave very, very pleasantly upward and very unpleasantly downward, those people are not um, in favor. Oh wow! Yeah, so it moves I, me I, very quickly when when I see that. There's a saying about having your hand up, but then kicking down. Oh, you're yeah. It's this man. Absolutely disgusting. Um, disgusting. <laughs> I, I, this isn't very rapid anymore. But with regards to your your um, dislike for tardiness or lack of punctuality, I read this on LinkedIn a couple of years ago, and I thought it was brilliant. It was you know a quote box, and it said. No, you're not sorry. You're late. You're disrespectful, and you're rude. <laughs> <laughs> this is when saying "oh, sorry" uh, rub, rubs people the wrong way because yeah, exactly, really, if you want to be really sorry, sometimes there are of course uh, reasons, but, yeah, uh, yeah, compelling reasons. But yeah, it's a sign that you're paying attention to the other. That exactly, it's disrespectful. and in, in a sense of power as this mutually enhancing proposition. That yes. we could get so much out of. Punctuality is just one sign that you didn't pay attention enough. Absolutely. Well put. Okay, question number two. What type of learner are you? Uh, okay. Um, oh, not kinesthetic. Oh, <laughs> I don't think so. Um, visual and auditory, probably. Yes, are, are, the, are the two. Uh, okay. I remember the things I see and hear. Okay. Introvert or extrovert? <laughs> uh, off the charts, extrovert. I thought so. You and me too. You, <laughs> you and figured, me too. huh? You yeah. figured. Question number four: Communication preference for personal conversation. So, what what media platform or or type of type of communication do you use? Yeah, I'm an email addict. Um, do much much worse with um, calls, unless they're video calls. Okay. Uh, the video call makes it feel like it's a social, like it's like it's a party, <laughs> because I see all of you, I see you smiling, and yeah. that makes, puts me in the right uh, state of mind. The phone call is just too too dry to be appealing. Uh, okay. Last question: Is there a podcast that you recommend the most lately? Oh man. Okay. Um, oh, can I mention three? Sure. <laughs> Power so, three, make it quick. Um, power three, exactly. Uh, I mentioned the ones that currently I'm listening to the most, but they shift over time. Yeah. Uh, one is maybe a little too obvious is the Ezra Klein uh, New York Times yeah. uh, podcast, only because of the range of insights. Uh, we go from politics to science to poetry. Um, that that variety appeals and it typically uh, handled in interesting ways. Yeah. Uh, I listen to Science Versus, which is oh. a science podcast uh, that debunks or explores um, different phenomena. Uh, it could be medical, scientific, uh, whatever, and, um, and draws on the science on the subject mm. to make a determination. It's science versus hearsay versus... Um, all kinds of misconceptions yeah. and they clear them for you and they do it very beautiful and humorously. And I appreciate that oh, combo. That's a new one for me. 
Yeah, no, you all are highly recommended. It's it's wonderful. You always learn something, and it's based on actual scientific uh, exploration and uh, research papers. And you know, as a PhD, you you appreciate that kind of evidence, yeah. particular. Yeah. And the third one is uh, Sound Up Governance, which is a podcast uh, by my friend and former colleague Matt Fulbrook who is, uh, became an expert in governance. Mm. Um, you know, he's a, he's a eclectic man with all kinds of interests, including a, a very good ba- bass player. Uh, but he learned a ton about how to govern a business enterprise, family, uh, corporate, you name it. And it has this podcast that even though I'm not a governance person, I don't. That's not my field. It's not what I do. But anytime you are leading anything, automatically you have to learn how to govern the interests of multiple stakeholders. Mm. And I'm finding this podcast always offering some insight that I hadn't thought about. Mm. And, I, and and he's also entertaining because you know he throws in a little bit of music in it, <laughs> uh, being a musician, and it makes a, a topic that could be very dry and profoundly boring, uh, much more appealing and revealing of how we run our organizations. Okay, awesome. I'm going to put links to all three of those podcasts in the show notes. Please, Tiziana, is there anything else you want to add about power or about? Power for all. Before we go, I, I, I no the, the the book itself, and I will only say that uh, it, it's a book meant for um, two very different kinds of people: the people that have struggled with the relationship with power, found it frustrating or a bit, bit um, unnerving, and want to to relate to it in more kind of constructive ways. Mm. And it is a book for people who do have power who may need a reminder of what it means to do to do good work with it, to use it well, and to become happy with how you have deployed it in your life and to a constructive goals. So it really speaks to, to these very different kinds of people that, that yeah. have both embraced it almost too much or those who have eschewed it too much and they need to really relate to it. So I hope everybody finds a bit of um, insight in it. I I definitely did. And I'm sure that the listeners will as well. Thank you so much for, well, for writing the book and also for spending your time here with us. Thank you so much, Tiziana. Thank you, Andrea, for having me. It was such a pleasure to chat with you again. Isn't Tiziana great? I hope you'll read the book and enjoy it, devour it as much as I did. But in the meantime, if there are three things that I hope you can take away from this book, it's the three fallacies. I think that if you understand these three fallacies and start to recognize them in your personal conversations and in your interactions, both personally and professionally, you're going to have a leg up in terms of understanding interpersonal dynamics with regards to power. Okay. So the first fallacy is that power is permanent. No, it's not. Power is not a permanent possession or a trait. Rather, true power is always relative to the context or to the person in front of you. We tend to attribute power to people. In fact, we should attribute power to context. Have you ever noticed how Forbes magazine, their most powerful list changes every year? Exactly. The second fallacy is that power is a function of authority or rank in a hierarchy. No, it's not. There are many, many exceptions to this. Consider the manufacturing plant where maintenance workers have the power. Or think about the opinion leaders in your organization who don't have formal authority and they don't have formal rank, but they do have tons of influence. Okay, the last fallacy is that power is dirty. This is where I started. Wielding power is not a dirty endeavor. It does not mean manipulation or coercion. Simply put, power is not intrinsically good or bad. Rather, it's what we do with it that can be good or bad. Kind of like networking and some other charged terms. 
Networking itself is not bad. Power itself is not bad. It's what we do with power that can be good or bad, right? And yes, power can certainly be used for good. This is one of my favorite points in this book. It's optimistic and inspiring. It's a great way to think about power. And it's a reminder that power is everyone's business. There's certainly a lot more to this book than the three fallacies that I just summarized here. And I really hope that you'll choose to read it or listen to this book. You can find links to the audio and print versions of this book in the show notes. Thanks again to Professor Tiziana Cacharo for sharing her insights with all of us. It was so nice to connect with you, Tiziana. All right, that's it for this episode. If you ever have any questions or suggestions for me, I love hearing from you. There are multiple ways that you can connect with me. Everything is on the talkabouttalk.com website, so that's probably the best place to start. From there, you can send me a message, you can connect with me on LinkedIn, you can even leave me an audio recording. Like I said, I love hearing from you. Bring it on. And if you enjoyed this episode, I really hope you'll share it with your friends and maybe even leave me a review on whatever podcast app you're using. It can really make a big difference and I really appreciate it. That's it. Thanks for listening and talk soon. Talk soon.